Hello and welcome back to Cinema 30. This week we have a fantastic uh, topic, production design, the building of sets. We're in week seven and we're building to our case study of Grand Budapest Hotel and the quiz next week. So this is a subject very close to my heart because I've worked the most in production design when I worked in the film industry. So let's get into it. So I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully your book's open and you're ready to go. Okay, here we go, production design. Okay, so when we say set building, um, what we really, you know, when we say production design, we're talking about sets, locations, props, vehicles, costumes, everything, okay? So production design, here we see the set for Life Aquatic, another Wes Anderson film. Look at the elaborateness of the set, look at the dolphins. I mean, this is the level that people go to. This set costs millions to build just for a movie. So everything you see on the screen, the clothes, the colors, the whole way the image is set up, that's all production design. Everything but the characters and the actors, okay? That's all production design. Here you can see some drawings um, of buildings. These were, I guess, sets that were built. Here's some Black Panther. Uh, the setting you know, creates the scene, makes it look realistic. If we have a fantasy film like this one, then uh, we need to create an entire world. That's why sci-fi fantasy films have the most elaborate set design and usually win for production design in the Academy Awards. Here's a very famous iconic set, the War Room set from uh, Dr. Strangelove. And it was so realistic and it was so embedded in the psyche of the country. When President Reagan went to the White House, one of the first questions he asked is, where is the War Room? People expected a room like this. It became the image of what that would look like. So here's some classic Hollywood set design. Back in the day, of course, a lot more emphasis on built sets. This is from the 30s. Um, but still today, even with CGI, here's the, the ice um, castle, if you will, from Inception. Um, that was built to, to create enough realism. Look at that. You, you can't tell. It's right next to all these modern buildings. But when the way they shoot the film, it's in the Arctic. So almost everything you look at on a screen is production design, except for actors and lighting, everything else is production design. All the visual information on the set was carefully planned and placed for you to see in the shot from the color to the props to just obvious, simple little things. Everything was thought out. Uh, production design starts early. That's one of the first things they got to get going because they've got to build all these sets. They've got to find all these props. And they work until the shooting is finished. Once picture is locked, then they can tear down the sets. So everything you see except the actors. So all of the, the lighting here and um, all these little props, the hay, anything, the bag this person's carrying, all that has to be acquired. So let's get into the department. The art department, it's sometimes called. The head of the art department is the production designer. He will have several other people working underneath him, art directors and set designers. Now, you know, really the production designer has the full set of skills, but these guys are specialists. They may be working to be production designers. That includes prop makers, graphic designers, artists, carpenters, so on and so forth. A bunch of a team of artists all come together to make a film. So first off, the production designer, he's one of the top five creatives on the film, along with the director, the DP, the sound designer, the producer. These are the folks that have the biggest hand in what a film looks like. And production designers will be hired by specific directors to get specific looks. It starts with drawing, um, lots of consultation with the director. And from those drawings, things get built. So they're artists, designers, and visionaries. They, they do more than just um, make sketches. They also create concepts. What would the interior look like? What kind of prop would this person use? They really help create the character. So the art department is many different people. You have artists who build things, you have uh, people who design things, uh, people who shop and find things. On the production crew, when you're actually shooting, you have uh, set dressers who move around the set pieces, prop masters who deal with props. Props are different from set pieces. If an actor touches it, it's considered a prop, okay? That's the difference. Scenics are your painters and of course, special effects. Um, very often repairs are needed. So you have people on set who fix things, move things around, uh, wire them for lighting. So sets, interior rooms, all walls, furniture, dressing, practical lighting. Practical lighting, remember, our lighting light that we see on set. 
backgrounds, including paintings, props, devices, weapons, tools, vehicles. That's part of art department. You got to, if you're doing a period piece, you got to bring in a bunch of retro cars, miniatures. Yes, miniatures are built, particularly for sci fi and fantasy. Graphic design, any painted props, locations. So that's also part of production design. Like, what are we going to do to modify a location? And of course, special effects. We'll get into it. So we got set construction. Yep. We got graphic design. People, you know, look at all these posters that you have in uh, Harry Potter and the, all the things you see behind this guy. Someone either found or actually made that to be on camera. That just doesn't show up. Also, we've got storyboards. Storyboards are the drawings that are done about the production and how, it will, how the shots will be taken. So here you see a breakdown of all the ver various shots um, that are happening within a film. These drawings are done so that the director can communicate what he wants and what he wants to see in the frame. Prop makers, people who make all these props, look at these cats from uh, Alice in Wonderland, I believe. Um, all these details are, are handmade by somebody. So dozens of art artists working behind the scenes. They may never even be on set. They work in their own studios. You also have a costume designer who generally, costume department's a little separate. They, they, the costume designer has to work with the production designer to match what's going on, but they're given on quite a lot of leeway, seamstresses, costume artists. And then when we shoot the film, we have a wardrobe person in charge. So <clears throat> considerations for the production designer, what do they got to think about? How do they do their job? Okay, so first off, budget and schedule. That's the number one consideration. How much money do I have? How much time do I have? It's like planning a vacation, except you're working a lot. So if we're planning to shoot, say a year from now, I've got a year to design and build my sets. I've got to get them approved, a lot of work. Second thing, aesthetics. What is the look and feel the director is going for? Is it a historical piece? Are we going for realism or formalism? Are we going to make it look like reality? We want it to feel like right now and real? Or are we doing something more fanciful? Is this a fantasy film? Can we play with things? Culture, interior versus exteriors, and then also character. How can you express the character through production design? Particularly their personal apartment or dwelling would be something that you would do. So What's the look you're going for? So, you know, this is a fantasy sci-fi film, very different from say Star Wars. Star Wars is serious and this, at least this part of it, this is the empire, the, this is the Death Star, it's dark. They wanted to convey a certain tone. This is Guardians of the Galaxy. It's conveying a very different tone. It's light. You have characters with green and blue skin, okay? Um, this is a different sci-fi look. This is uh, from Ed Astra. It's going for a real serious sort of somber look. So lots of realism, muted tones. And in this particular scene, we have a whole another feel, very futuristic. So what are the expectations? What is the tone and the themes of the film? That's what, how the production designer begins. Is it realism or formalism? So here, this is from... Um, uh, Downton Abbey, and we're going for realism. We're trying to capture the time. So everything has to be accurate. Here, we're looking at formalism. This is from Grand Budapest Hotel, which is the film you're going to be doing for your case study. It's much more theatrical, colorful, extravagant. Same thing here, City of Lost Children. They're not going for realism. They're creating a fantasy past or a fantasy future. So uh, set and characters. We looked at the, this example before. This is from um, uh, eternal sunshine uh, the character's depressed the setting should look depressed the character's depressed the setting look, should look depressed this is from adaptation this is from uh, grand budapest hotel very fanciful costumes um this from star wars so steps in pre-production first off drawings lots and lots of drawings you have to show the director what you intend to do drawings are cheap buying and building things are expensive so drawings first Pre-production, your uh, director and producer are going to meet. They're going to envision budget consideration, visual palette selected. I want it to be reddish. I want it to be dark. Script analysis. We're going to go scene by scene. And then research begin. This is all done by the production designer. Then he begins to do concept drawings, okay? Now, before he goes any further, those drawings have to be approved by the director. Then models are built sometimes. And then sometimes they do something called pre-visualization, where it's just a CD sketch of what it will look like. Um, here's a script. So here's some notes that a production designer has put on the script. He's reading the script and seeing what he needs to provide, what needs to be on camera, and what things that aren't mentioned should be on camera. 
lots of planning meetings, lots of discussing. Uh, duties are detailed and, and uh, delegated to other people. Plenty of research too, going back in time and looking at the way things were done for a historical piece. Um, maybe reading science journals to find out what might be happening in the future for a science fiction piece. Uh, this is a concept called a mood board where a designer might kind of pick the colors and the textures and the images that they're trying to evoke in their design. They're just sort of giving themselves a palette of, of flavor from which to work from. Uh, they create the style and the look of the film from drawings. So again, what are the practical considerations? Time, budgets, can't just be pretty. It must be functional and safe. I mean, the doors have to open. The windows, if they get used, have to you know slide up and open. You also have to think of the needs of the director. You have to accommodate blocking and mise-en-scene. If he's got a huge battle sequence plan, then you can't have too much furniture or too little space. You have to think about the needs of the DP. So where is the lighting going to go? And where's the camera going to go? And this is why walls of sets are often made movable, particularly in a, um, a studio situation. It allows for camera pace. So we can just take out a wall, put lights there. Perfect. You can't do that on location. So team goes to work on design. Once concepts are approved, drawings are made. Once uh, they're approved, more drawings are made. When the models are made, then sets are built, then they're paint and, painted and directed. They might be modified. Start with the simplest of drawings, move to more complex drawings. And this might happen on a napkin over lunch or dinner with a director. Um, more elaborate drawings are made. And these aren't always done by the production designer. He has other people to do this as well, okay? So here we see a, a, an elaborate drawings made for an elaborate set that was built, made to look old. I guess they couldn't find this and they needed certain things. So they went out and they built it. So a couple of terms here to remember, um, just sort of dividing things up. We have interior studio sets. We have exterior stu studio sets. We have interior locations. We have exterior locations, okay? So real locations versus a studio set where you built everything. When we say on location, it means that the film is shot on location at a real location. If we say on set, that could be on a location or on a studio because you're either one is a set. Sound stages we've talked about, large soundproof studios, back lots, we'll look in that. And here we go. So there's a sound stage. I think we've looked at this before, just a giant empty room that's soundproof and dark with plenty of power. That's where you see sets like this. Now this is from an older age of Hollywood. Obviously it doesn't look nearly realistic enough. The, the walls look like they were, you know, cut from uh, production materials. A little bit cheesy, but that was the standard back then. Um, here's how set uh, sets are often built, even plans for for building sets. Here we see the soundstage. Uh, they're beginning to go to work. Uh, sets have to be painted. Uh, many artists go to work on a film, and their uh, scenics are one of the jobs. Interior sets. Now this was probably shot in a studio. This room was built, the wallpaper was put on, everything tricked out, including all the props. Uh, here's an example of an interior set. Notice that there's no wall, so the camera and the lighting can be anywhere they want. Very often they build these sets inside of a studio and sort of encase them so they can bang lights in from the outside and you never know that you're inside of a studio. Um, the reason they do that, it's a lot more controlled. Look at all the lights they have around there. Now there's also exterior studio sets, okay? Sometimes they're called backlots. This is where they actually build a set or they use an existing set and they shoot there to make it look like it's outside, but it's not. And look at this very elaborate set here. I mean, they're, they're actually shooting like a desert, making it look like a real physical location um, that rather than going to a location, that's fascinating. Oh, look at this. Now, this is uh, an airplane shot. Why bother to rent an airplane and deal with the size and the constraints of the interior when you can just <clears throat> build a uh, set that looks like an airplane and shoot your film much easier? Props and art are made. This is one from the um, Lord of the Rings, if you remember um, Gondor. Um, so this is a very elaborate miniature, obviously, but someone had to build it. Um, lots of artists deployed. Also set dressing. So everything you see from pictures hanging on the wall to um, silverware to light fixtures, 
to all the, the, the wine, the glasses, the roses, the lamp that you see here in this shot, everything had to be found and selected and picked and used. So the advantage of shooting on a soundstage, it's quiet, soundproof environment, access to power, access to equipment. It's a controlled environment. It can be dark 24 seven. You got a large uh, workspace with bathrooms and a cafeteria. You can remove malls, walls and put the camera anywhere. Now the disadvantage of shooting on a soundstage, it's fake. It has to be built and dressed to look real. For interiors, that's not a problem. For exteriors, it's a little tougher. So you also have something called backlots and backlots are these you know, fake storefronts that you see here. If you trick this out, put some old cars here, you can make it anytime in any place. Um, maybe you've ta taken the tour of Universal Studios, they take you through the back lot and they still use these because remember, you only have to show what the camera is looking at and you could just look at one small corner and you could shoot this whole back lot for an entire city. Uh, on the Universal lot is the famous uh, Psycho House, which uh, if you've taken the tour, then you've seen. Also Blade Runner, um, they modified existing backlots. So this was a backlot, I believe, but I'm not sure if this is a universal, but they added all this neon. They added all of this various uh, lighting to make it into a futuristic set. So cars, the two things that are key to time period are car, hairstyles, and costumes. Those are the things that most dramatically define something in time. Yes, architecture, the further you go back, but cars, hair, and um, costumes. So exterior locations, we see all this, the hairstyles and the costumes all match. Let's break it down further. So you have interiors versus exteriors. You have soundstage versus the back lot. You have in-studio, which would be a soundstage versus exterior locations. Just make sure you all understand all those terms and you can shoot night or day for either of these, night or day for either, okay? So here we have some classic establishing shots. I mean, these are famous places, the Louvre uh, pyramids. If you're shooting a film in these locations, you're gonna take a shot of this um, just to establish the location. Um, this is the design for the pyramid in Dune. It was based off an existing pyramid. Very often designers will do that. They will evoke images. Now here, this is a shot from um, Harry Potter. And you'll notice that this thing has been added. This is the real location. They added the snow. That's right, it's fake snow. And they added this for whatever reason, which it doesn't actually exist. Here's the house used for little women. Very often um, historic locations are used. Okay, here's the interior set. Now see something this elaborate would be difficult to build. So probably they used an actual location, an actual home for this. Interior location here, they're shooting in a cathedral. That would be very hard to build. So they're gonna pay the money to rent the location. Here's a famous location in Los Angeles. This, you can visit this. This is called the Bradbury Building. It's been used in multitude of films, most famously Blade Runner. It's downtown, I believe on Hill Street. Here's the, uh, the bowling alley from the Big Lebowski. Yep, it does exist somewhere in Los Angeles. Here's the bus stop from um, Forrest Gump. So this, this is not, the, the, the background here exists, but I believe they built some of these elements, maybe this hedge, I'm not sure, but they added to an, an actual location to give it the look that they wanted. When you're shooting on the street, you've got to lock off the street. That means you got to make sure there's nobody, no bystanders watching what's going on. You have to control the entire environment. Anything that's seen in the shot has to be controlled. Here we are in exterior location. That's Christopher Nolan on the set discussing how the scene will be shot um, for his most recent war film. So advantages of location shooting, real locations look better in the ad realism, obviously. It upgrades the production value. It really takes your film to another level. I mean, when we say production value, it means how much, you know, how much budget, how much money, how elaborate is this production? Um, you don't have to build a set. Disadvantages, you got to transport your gear, your power, your toilets, you got to hire security. It's noisy. Clean dialogue is a challenge and it's expensive. This is when production really gets expensive. And let's not forget insurance in case something goes wrong. So here is an actual location you can rent. This is in Los Angeles on Fairfax and it's an actual diner, but the interior, it just, it only rents out for use in movie shoots. It's not a functioning restaurant, but they have all the props and everything's ready for you. So a few times a year, people use it. Now here's a really cool 
location you can visit. And I left this down in the optional information. There's, this is a website you can go to and it'll show you any location. So this is a location where they dumped Donnie's ashes in the Big Lebowski. This is an actual location you can visit and they've got it marked. So if you're a real big fan of a film, you can go to any location that, that they use. So here, one of the jobs for in, the, in production is a location scout. And this person goes and finds location. Here you see them with their camera. Maybe he sees this, oh, this is a perfect location for this shot, okay? And they're looking for individual shots and locations to use. And they're drawing on maps and they're taking photographs and showing them to the director. The director doesn't have to do the scout, but once they've seen the photographs, they'll actually go to the location and see. So the location department is not part of the production design. It's really more part of production. They work directly for the producer. So you have location scouts, locations manager, security, food service, parking boss. You got to think about all this stuff, including getting permits to block off parking. You got to have security. You got to have bathrooms for all the people. You've got to feed, feed them. You don't want them leaving set to go get food. And you've got to park 20 cars, huge trucks. All this is a consideration and it all costs money. Locations can convey theme and tone. So here we have a location, just a simple parking lot from Fargo. And uh, this conveys the loneliness of this scene in this shot. So if you saw Parasite, that the house, most of the film takes place in this luxurious house. Well, that house was built. It was built specifically to be shot for the film because they had very specific needs because of the hidden room and so forth. So um, they built it also so they could take it apart and shoot it the way they wanted. So this is a fantastic example of production design. Um, creating a real looking set on location. This is from The Lord of the Rings where they went in and they planted the plants years in advance and they let them grow in. They wanted the plants to have a full year or more before they began shooting. They built this a year to two years before they began shooting. And then they come in with props and fill it all in. So real quickly, uh, Wes Anderson has great set design. So let's look at it. This is the boat famously from Life Aquatic. There's Bill Murray in front of the set. They built uh, theatrical set pieces like these vehicles. N notice the color, all that was chosen. The fact that the color of the set matches the costumes, that wasn't a mistake. That was all planned in advance. This is from Grand Budapest Hotel. He's, he likes very flamboyant characters and color. This is an example of formalism. He's not trying to be realistic and, or accurate to the time period. He's playing with it uh, and through formalism, using color to express uh, emotion and uh, character. So here we see, here's the character introduction for um, our main character. Here's a character introduction for one of the villains of the film. Notice how the tones are darker and the look on his face is serious. The look on his face is very happy, very colorful. So this tells us a lot about character with just the production design. Remember, we'll see a lot of symmetrical framing in Grand Puda Best Hotel. That's something to pay attention to. And just the mise-en-scene, all the little things that are added here, the lights, the books, um, that doesn't happen by accident. Someone had to plan that. Now we're moving on to props. Props are a very important part of uh, filmmaking and they really make things come to life and they all have to be built or found. Uh, they're des often designed and built, especially specialty props and they have to work. Like this one had to be able to spew smoke. Um, as well as CGI, they do actually build some of the physical props that uh, Tony Stark uses in Iron Man, okay? So when it's on his body like that, it's just easier to build something. When he's flying through the air and he's got his face covered, that's CGI. Here's the Death Star from Star Wars that had to be built, including a destroyed version, okay? So you had a perfect version, you had a broken version. Um, prop makers are all over Los Angeles, California, really the world, they can work from anywhere. They receive the drawings and they execute the design or they come up with the design. Here's uh, the, one of the props from Ghostbusters. Uh, here's of course the famous prop of Captain America. And these things have to be designed to use practically. Okay, they have to look good on camera and then the actor has to be able to hold it up. So usually there's a number of different ones made. Okay, for example, the shield, a prop like that actually has dozens of different versions. Okay, 
there's there's one for running so there's a light one that he can run with there's an aerodynamic one for throwing there's a really hard metal one in case someone has to whack a sword on it okay um, there's a damage one for after a battle and then you have multiple copies of all of those in case one of those gets damaged so really one prop is many props okay so little famous props uh, that you probably recognize from different films uh, these all had to be built um, someone had to create that and one of the places that are used are something called a prop house these are all over los angeles and southern california these are just warehouses that have old furniture. They have just unbelievable things like these giant globes. I mean, who has one of those laying around their house? But if you have a professor character, maybe you need one of these for his den. Uh, they're all stacked up. You can find anything, even simple things, plates, plants, or fake plants. All this stuff can be found in a prop house. So you don't have to go and find everything on your own or buy it. Food. Uh, some of these foods are freeze dried. If no one's going to eat the food, it's just going to be on the plate in the background. And you don't want real food on the plate getting smelly. You actually get like a fake food and that's on the fate and the on the plate on the tables in the background. Maybe your actual central characters are actually eating real food. So design includes vehicles, devices and monsters like we see here with uh, Jaws. Now, this was one of the most famous shark props. It was initially called Bruce. and um, it works so poorly, uh, Spielberg began labeling it the great white turd. And it actually affected the way that he shot the film. It was so, it, dis, it misfunctioned so much that they actually had to use the POV of the shark and they cut out a lot of the shots of the shark until the end of the film, because they didn't think it looked realistic. So it actually affected the film. And now it's a part of cinema history at the museum. So special effects, here's one from Independence Day. Here's one from the history of Hollywood. This has always been a part of Hollywood uh, history is to be able to create something fast and fantastic on the screen. So let's break them down a little bit. We've got in-camera effects. So those are the things that are happening in the camera, not in post-production. You're shooting it, you're seeing it. So you've got mechanical effects like puppets and anatomics. You've got weather effects. That's right, wind, rain, fog, snow can be created. And then you've got live special effects such as pyrotechnics, fire, explosion, bullets going off and stunts and special effects sets and props. So let's take a look. So here's from Star Wars. We've got uh, those little uh, fun, fantastic creatures from Return of the Jedi, I believe it was, or Rebirth of the Jedi, uh, were actually puppets that they created. Star Wars is famous for using a lot of puppets. Now, this is the one of the animals, one of the monsters from Alien. This was an actual prop, presumably that could be moved. But they also had aliens in costumes with you need the character to run, you need the creature to run, you could use someone in a costume. If it's just standing there being ominous, maybe it's a prop, maybe it's a robot, it's hard to say. Uh, classic special effects, here's a couple examples from American Werewolf in London, Luke's hand in the, uh, the second Star Wars, and the melting skull from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Those were all practical uh, effects. For the melting skull, they used a wax model of a human face and they superheated it and it, they had little blood squibs in there and that's what it creates the effect that you're seeing. That was all done in camera. Today, we'd probably use CGI. And yes, weather is faked and created. Here you have a whole interior set. It's not even outside, but they're faking an outside and they're faking snow and they have devices that can actually spread snow. They also have blankets. These are actual blankets that look like snow. Mm -hmm. And they have whole separate crews that come in and do that. Rain crews, as you can see here, they have these devices that set up that will shoot rain or will just drop it straight down, depending on what you want. Fog, okay, fans, wind, blowing the fog, all this is possible. Pyrotechnics, blowing up stuff on set. They have a whole separate crew. There's a lot of safety considerations. Usually a specific person is brought in for just the days of, uh, that you're going to be using pyrotechnics or explosions. Uh, blood squibs. These are really classics. Again, you're just going to bring in this specialist to do this from the day. So it's basically a little package that has blood and it's got a trigger. It's wired when the trigger is thrown. Uh, something, I guess it's a tiny explosion and out squirts the blood. You could put this little opening on the side if you wanted a different, different effect, but here's what it looks like on camera. You ever wonder how much how they're able to break glass so easily in films? Well, it's called sugar glass. It actually breaks easily and it doesn't go into shards that cut people. 
Those of you that might have seen Inception, you remember there's this famous scene where the room rotates, okay? So they actually built this set. And I have this in your book. If you're following along, let's not forget to do that. Uh, this week's the page numbers are in the left side, not the right side. But I have this drawing in your booklet where they actually built this set. They built this to actually work and run for just a scene that cost, that was like, oh, oh my gosh, 45 seconds. And this technology was based on what was done in 2001. We'll come to that. Here it is. This was a giant rotating set built uh, by Kubrick for 2001. Uh, here's what the exterior looked like. This was built costing thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay? And this was the interior. This was the effect they got. And what you don't see is that this person is running. He's running through the set as it rotates. So Kubrick wanted to give us this feeling of this rotating spaceship. <clears throat> and he went to the extra effort to have one of these characters run through the ship to give us the realism of doing that. So this whole shot had to be designed on creating this illusion. You see this little narrow slit in the floor? That was actually where the camera was mounted on a, on a device and it followed the character through the shot. Everything in this film had to be built. Nothing could, every, nothing could be bought or found. And they went to extreme detail. Everything worked on the set. All the lights lit up. When you push them, the light went on or off. Um, and really what they were doing is creating the future. Uh, Kubrick's look into the future really affected 60s design and it affected, affected all films after it as to what the future might look like. And actually his vision is coming to life with uh, SpaceX private flights. I mean, they're very expensive now, but that's what we saw in 2001. And he did this with the help of uh, his production designer was a guy by the name of Douglas Trumbull. And I just wanted to throw uh, a special nod to a real wizard of the industry. And a couple of the films he did, Close Encounters, he built this, Blade Runner. He went on to do a lot of films and was a real pioneer. A lot of his techniques are still used today by uh, all the folks. So other forms of movie trickery, we've got matte painting, miniatures, optical effects, green screen, motion capture, and of course, CGI. Let's go through it. So this is matte painting. That's right. That is a painting. Uh, the figure you see scooting across here, this will be animated in, almost CGI'd in. That will be shot. But this whole environment can be faked, okay, with just a painting. Isn't that amazing? Uh, matte painting is painting representation of a landscape set or distant location that allows filmmakers to create the illusion of an environment that is non-existent in real life or would otherwise be too expensive to make. So the painting does the job. Now, obviously you have a real location, you don't need it. Here's a painting set, I believe from a James Bond film. Um, you can create something that, you know, there's no way you can build that and you can't find it. So you have to paint it. Now here's an example. So this is a real live set that they're in a, in a water tank and these people are rowing out. Somewhere out here is an actual painting. They probably animate the smoke coming out of here. This would be very hard to shoot but they can shoot it on a set in a controlled location where the actors are in the foreground, the painting is in the background. Now this one blew my mind when I found it, but in this shot from Star Wars where the emperor gets off of his private ship, all these stormtroopers in here were painted in. They don't move, they're stiff, they're just little light squibbles. So they were able to paint them with, rather than actually cast actors, a lot cheaper. Here's a Roman set where this was done. This was a fabulous background of the Roman city. Here's a famous example from Planet of the Apes where they just painted in the destroyed Statue of Liberty showing that it was the future. Miniatures, very popular on set, miniatures. Uh, this is from Night in the Museum, as you would imagine. And these sets are elaborate. Um, our Wes Anderson loves his miniatures. And here's a miniature animated film. Very popular in Hollywood, often save time and money. And if done right, can look very realistic. Here's Blade Runner 2049. That was a recent movie, but they used miniatures for some of the sets. Uh, director plans their shot. They, it really allows them to see everything. They can use the camera to move around. Here's a famous set from uh, Gus, Ghostbusters. Notice that there's dozens of people. And notice that you know the set's only big enough for what the camera needs to see, okay? And this is, of course, the famous set from Ghostbusters and the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Here's Bill, here's Bill Murray falling asleep on set. Uh, miniatures, here's Spielberg using miniatures for Raiders. There's actually a miniature shot in that film. 
Optical effects. So the lightsabers in Star Wars are added with optical effects. Um, it's simply, it's basically printing light onto the frame. And this has been done for a lot of cool special effects, famously in 2001. This is a little outdated now. Mostly we've moved on to CGI. So uh, green screen is, I guess, a form of CGI, but it's not full CGI in that you're shooting an actual scene as we see here. And then they have this sort of dummy uh, put here for her to pet. And then later on, they CGI what the dragon actually looks like. All right. Now the CG or rather green screen got its start famously in weather. You know, here we see some weather forecasters in front of a green screen with green clothing on. So they get lost. It looks something like this, a full studio. And you can turn any studio into a green screen studio by just simply putting up one of these green screens, okay? It doesn't have to be painted walls. Um, this is from uh, Mad, Mad Max Fury Road. You see the um, her arm is removed. So it looks like that she's got a robotic arm, okay? I love this usage. So they, they love these two buildings and they love the realism of those two buildings, but this part doesn't work, okay? So they just block it out with green screen and then they're only shooting down here. And then this is digitally added. A lot cheaper, a lot better. Here from Wolf of Wall Street, you thought he was at some luxurious uh, tropical location. They actually shot that maybe in a studio and faked it and just added in the location. Notice the location is out of focus, so it makes it easier. I think this might be from Walking Dead. You can see how the green screen has an effect. Uh, combining partial real sets with green screen adds a lot of realism. So the actors have a way, have something physical to interact with. Um, here you have the fabulous creatures. The people that operate the fabulous creatures are also green, so they aren't filmed. Uh, Superman flying, that's all done with guide wires, which are eventually erased. On a, black, on a green screen, and then what he's flying through is added after. I believe this is from another fantasy film, perhaps Alice in Wonderland. This is from Game of Thrones. They were climbing up the wall. They just laid a wall flat. And they pretended to be climbing up it, and then they added the CGI to add the extra length to it. They added to the wall with CGI. So you have a partially real set mixed with CGI to extend it. Some of you might have seen The Revenant, where there's this really elaborate, very believable bear attack. And that was accomplished with a guy in a bear suit with extra padding added to, added to make him look big. He's in blue, blue and green screen, same thing. And then they later CGI'd the bear in. But you got an actor to be able to do uh, what was there. So here we have, uh, this is from Infinity War, where you have Thor about to punch uh, Thanos, well, he has a lot bigger heads. So they build this thing here so that Thor is dealing with something that's about the size of that Thanos would be. And that leads us to motion capture, which is also called mocap. It's a technology driven method of capturing an actor's face and motion and his physicality, and then it's translated to a CGI character. So here we see from Avatar all the little subtle, subtle moves on his face when his skin wrinkles. That's captured by motion capture and he's acting in the scene. And then later the CGI character is swapped into the scene on top of the actor's face, if you will, okay? This is especially done for physical stuff, optical effects, uh, uh, visual effects. These are all done uh, in post. Here's another example of uh, motion capture where we have uh, all these different cameras capturing different motion by an actor. Uh, it's then digitized. They can totally, they now have it in the computer. And now all they have to do is overlay the characters that they create. They can make them real in a 3D space. More motion capture from Planet of the Apes. It starts out as motion capture. Eventually they build the character, then they graph it onto the body of the actor. This was done in Lord of the Rings. They were one of the original pioneers of it. Again, using a real actor, same actor here, uh, Andy Serkis, who's kind of became famous as the mocap physical actor to do a lot of these types of roles. Here's from Avatar. Now oh, here's from um, uh, Avengers. Notice that they've got these guys, they've got some people running on conveyor belts and I, get, I assume these things move. I can, I guess, slide out and they're motorized. So it looks like they're flying, okay? And Spider-Man is being swung, okay? So here they are again. I mean, th this is what you saw in the movie, but actually these guys were running on a uh, conveyor belt so they could do all this through CGI. Isn't that fascinating? 
And CGI has really taken over Hollywood. You guys know this better than I do. Uh, so many films are done with CGI because frankly, it's just cheaper. It's just a lot cheaper to create some of these fantastic images by CGI than anything else. We, we wouldn't have so many superhero movies and so many action movies if we didn't have CGI. Like this example here, buildings collapsing, that'd be very expensive to do in real life, but now we can do it easily. CGI allows us to show things that we never could before, like floating bullets. It allows us to map out a car flipping over and exploding with people falling out of it. Um, that would be very difficult and expensive to do, and now they can do it much easier and much safer. It's not cheap though. Um, CGI still costs money. It's not like it eliminates the cost. Here we see Mad Max and we see them uh, grafting all of the, this is what they built. And then they, I guess, graft this stuff over top of it to make it look more realistic, including the waterfall. Lion King was done completely in CGI and looked like it. Uh, CGI added to live images. So here you have the actual actor, Paul Bellamy, and then things like this little chin thing, the glowing, all that stuff is added, which is kind of interesting. They really just want to get the real realism of his face and they add everything in. Back to Mad Max. This was what was actually there when they shot it. This is what you saw on the screen. Some of the stuff was added in with CGI because it was cheaper to do so. And also lots of extras. You can save a lot of money by not hiring a thousand people you have to feed. You just use a uh, copy and paste tool and make more extras in the background. Okay, moving on to costumes. We don't have a lot of time for costumes, but we'll get into it. Costume is character. Here is from uh, Showgirls or this recent Jennifer Lawrence movie. Um, uh, these characters' costumes really convey a lot about who they are. Costumes can be grand, um, uh, beautiful. By the way, I screwed up there. That's not Jennifer Lawrence. That's uh, Jennifer Lopez. Sorry, J-Lo. Um, here we go. We see uh, grand costumes for Cleopatra. Uh, set and costumes can match each other. Here we see for, for uh, Downton Abbey. This was all designed together so that they flow and look good together. This is done by a costume designer working separate from production designer, but in coordination. Um, you have a wardrobe department that handles all the various costumes that you have on set. Remember, you've got to also outfit all your extras in a, in a, in a period piece. If you've got soldiers, you've got to have costumes for hundreds of soldiers. And uh, you know, they all need costumes. And that's all stored and organized by the wardrobe department. Fantasy costumes are very elaborate, particularly dresses for princesses, as we see here. Here's the famous red slippers from uh, Wizard of Oz. Uh, women's gowns in particular need to be special because, you know, they have to show off in, in the film and that has to be part of the character. It all starts with drawings, though, okay? Uh, even for films that are set in modern times, like um, L.A. Story, um, they, 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 they still spend time to design these costumes. They design them to fit perfectly to the actor. So here's the designer says, I wanted women in the audience to be wooed by Ryan and the men to feel romantic about Emma. So the costumes do that. It is simple things like this. This is a shot from Venice Beach. Um, and of course, multiple copies are made and they're tailored to fit the actor or actress involved. Um, simple male costumes can become iconic. Here we see the famous sheriff from um, High Noon and that costume was the inspiration for Han Solo in Star Wars, which has now become iconic. Hair and makeup famously used here by Jared Leto as the Joker. Uh, makeup and mask adjusted right up until shooting. These things are really hot. So that's why they have to tweak them right up until the time and they have to consider for the actors their comfort. Uh, we can do aging as we see here of J Jared Leto, famously the makeup that I believe Heath Ledger came up with on his own that was so important to the Joker character. We can take someone very beautiful, add prosthetic nose, prosthetic ears and teeth, okay, to make them look very different. Oh, uh, turning pretty ugly. This is done by not, well, some makeup, but mostly by her gaining weight. Um, the shape of an actor's face is a canvas over which makeup or prosthetics can be laid, okay? It starts with the actor's face, okay? And that face is used, and we can see here from it, to make something fantastic. Um, some actors have great bone structure, like um, this actor here, who appears in a lot of movies as tough guys. 
in mess and makeup get tweaking during shooting and when, whenever they call cut the uh, makeup crew comes in tweaks it a little bit gives the actor a little water okay we're ready to roll they zip out and they start rolling you can find all this uh, monster makeup at a place called berman industries um, they do they do sell professional stuff to amateurs it's up in burbank california and so the last thought because we're running out of time i just want to give you guys just a little bit on vehicles um, remember Every vehicle that you've seen has to be brought there. So they literally have hundreds of, say, police cars for a scene. These cars might work or they might not work and they might just be kind of pushed into spot and they're parked. Every car you've seen in a film was placed there. So think about that next time you watch a movie. Um, real quickly on the Batmobile throw Tom. So in the 60s, you had the silly campy show. You ended up with a silly campy car. In the 90s, you had a more dark, stylized kind of fantasy world, not realistically dark, more like fantasy dark. So you got a fantasy dark car. As we move up into the Christopher Nolan, more modern um, Batman films, you ended up with a dark, very realistic tank-like looking device that looks like it could actually be built. And then here with the most recent Batman, they've kind of gone back to dark again, but it's more homemade. It looks like a modified sports car. So on that note, we will end our production design uh, conversation. Let's go to the review. So production design creates the look of the film and um, gives us the entire set to look at. And that's done by the production designer and they create design and draw. Under working underneath the production designers, the art directors, uh, set designers, props, scenics, um, things for, for consideration when you're designing you have your budget your aesthetic what do you look trying to get what is it supposed to look like realism versus formalism time period uh, does it need to work practical considerations we talked about interior sets versus exterior sets um, studios versus location shooting we also have a guy called a locations manager a location scout uh, props devices and vehicles we have uh, props makers who do that multiple copies of props are made let's not forget that most work for uh the production design is done in pre-production that's when they've got to really get their work done okay we moved on we talked a little bit about special effects in camera effects puppets miniatures weather effects live effects pyro um post-production visual effects we talked about those including cgi i didn't list cgi here oops that's a mistake but we it's going to be on there and we talked about co uh, costume, think about the color palette, the functionality, um, lighting. And remember, multiples are always made of every costume. You can't just have one. You got to have several costumes made. So that'll end our, uh, our lecture for today. I'm going to go back to um, stop the screen here and say my final words. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Please reach out with any questions. Remember, you've got a homework on production design and you've also got a quiz coming up. So hopefully you're ready for that. And uh, I thank you for listening.